I'm Tim Cohen. I wrote a book titled The Antichrist and the Cup of Tea. The first edition was published in 1998, and it is the first and only book to give extensive hard evidence on Charles, now King Charles III, as the biblical Antichrist, the person who will be over a global government for about three and a half years preceding Armageddon. So hasn't that uh, been rather ruined by him becoming king? No, not at all. Uh, the fact that the name or title has changed doesn't matter. He was identified as Prince of Wales as the Antichrist biblically, meaning that prophecy in Revelation 13, 18, which calls for the name calculation and so forth for the human being, the man who has the imagery of the beast in that chapter, which happens to be Charles' heraldic achievement as Prince of Wales, which is still his heraldic achievement. He's got multiple achievements now as king, but that verse was fulfilled when the calculation was done decades ago, and it has been all so this time. You, you've, you've said before that he wouldn't become king. I didn't think he needed to become king. I'm surprised that he became king. But it does not change the fact that he's the biblical antichrist. So uh, can you just run through the various uh, in proofs that you think uh, make him the antichrist if you're looking at the book of Revelation? Sure. So we always have to start with Scripture, and in this case, we would start with the 13th chapter of the Apocalypse, Revelation 13. There are two beasts described in that chapter, one arising out of the sea, another uh, out of the land, and this is geographically relative to where the nation of Israel is. So the first beast is typically understood to be the Antichrist, the one who will be over a global government, preceding Christ's return in Armageddon. The uh, the second beast is typically understood to be the false prophet who works in tandem with the Antichrist uh, under the devil. Charles would be the first beast, and there's imagery at the beginning of that chapter identifying the beast as having feet like a bear, body like a leopard, mouth like a lion, to whom the dragon, and in this case it's a fiery, fiery red dragon from the prior chapter, Revelation 12, identified as Satan himself, to whom the dragon gives his power, throne, and great authority. At the end of the 13th chapter of Revelation, it goes on to tell us, here is wisdom, let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. So the first thing is the imagery has to be present for the human being in question, that first beast imagery that I just cited. Charles is the only person in the history of the world to have that imagery including to have the uh, corresponding imagery in the Old Testament, Daniel chapter 7, which is a little horn having the eyes of a man or a unicorn with human eyes. Charles says all that, the red dragon, the beast with feet like a bear, body like a leopard, mouth like a lion, and then uh, the unicorn with human eyes on his heraldic achievement as Prince of Wales granted to him in July 1969. So that was the first thing that allowed us to do the calculation biblically, because it's the number of the beast, and then it's the number of a man, according to Revelation 13, verse 18. So Charles is the first human being in the history of the world for whom Christians are authorized to do the calculation. The second point is that the underlying Greek text from which the English is translated identifies the system on which to do the calculation. Most Christians don't know that, so they end up trying to invent or contrive a system. We're not biblically uh, authorized to do that. The actual system, which is given in my book, The Antichrist and Cup of Tea, including the first edition from uh, 1998, so the new edition is coming out uh, right now. But the 1998 edition has the name calculation in both Hebrew and English using that system, and it's a sequential, not a phonetic system, so you can use it in most languages by transferring it sequentially. But the title Charles Prince of Wales, by which he was known globally until very recently, calculates to exactly 666 in both English and Hebrew. And because of the sheer number of numbers, values that are involved in the calculation in both languages, mathematically, stati uh, statistically, uh, it's reasonable to say it's impossible for that calculation to even exist in one language, let alone two. But in this case, it's also in the context of him having the actual imagery. So while there's a great deal more to Charles and to the evidence, those things by themselves identify him as the Antichrist biblically for all time to Christians. 
Well, or, or at least uh, maybe they do, because, uh, I mean, there must be other interpretations, particularly of this 666, Tim. But anyway, you go into much more detail in your Antichrist and a Cup of Tea book. I know. So if anyone uh, would like to check it out, that's the place to do it. Uh, now, you know, this is uh, something also which uh, I find very difficult to understand, is that Charles is somebody who is very regularly on, on our TV screens. He's even got his own Earth TV channel or something now, uh, talking about uh, actually saving the environment. He's he's a, very keen on uh, things like organic food, although he's just come out and signed a, a, into law in Britain uh, a, a Genetic Modification Act. Um, which will allow genetic modification of these foods. Obviously, that's not very organic. Um, but I mean, why? Why is it that you you're sort of you seem to be maybe evilizing him a bit, saying he's an evil guy? He's out there surely uh, to look after the climate, look after the planet, like Greta Thunberg, who's actually one of his friends. Yeah, that's for public consumption. So the reality is, he's out there destroying the world and destroying mankind with those very agendas that he's claiming are to save mankind. Uh, biblically, the Antichrist will be named death when he's possessed by Satan, and that's right at the start of his three and a half year reign before Armageddon. So he's not there yet. He's not yet possessed by the devil, but he will be. And when he is, his name will be death. And that's because the agendas he's pursuing don't produce life or good things for the world. They produce death. And when no, we talk don't. about the environmentalism. No, yeah, no, they don't, because uh, actually what we're seeing is an enormous rain back of the use of fossil fuels. And, and I mean, whatever you say, uh, decrease in pollution. Uh, again, still destroy mankind. So I'll just explain. So right now, the world doesn't have the capacity to go to an all electric grid and, and uh, alternative energy sources outside of fossil fuels. There's not enough energy produced on the planet or even close to that within the next decade, even everything they're planning to build, we couldn't get there to sustain even what's currently used today, not even remotely close. Only a tiny fraction could be produced. So if they take away fossil fuels, Tony, with that goes transportation, goes the availability of food at your local store, goes food production, goes everything in fact that humanity requires in the West and in the modern world to survive. And by the time that our modern civilizations, you know, nations like the UK and the United States and so forth, realize what's happening when the electric grids are failing because there's not enough power on the grids, uh, and in some cases too much draw, you know, a mixture of that, so the grids themselves are failing with actual black, blackouts, failing transformers, et cetera. By the time we get there, it'll be too late to fix it because it takes years well, it's, to fix those it's things once they break. In, it's already happening in some parts of the world, in the United States uh, and in South Africa. Uh, but, uh, I mean, you know, I'm sure King Charles would say, well, actually, um, this is, this is we, we, we've been getting away scot-free with very cheap, polluting energy for a long time. What we're starting to think about doing is starting to pay the proper price for the energy we're using. Yeah, it's all a scam. Carbon is very good for the environment, very good for plants, carbon dioxide. The more carbon dioxide there is in our environment, so long as there's life on Earth, plant life, the more oxygen that gets produced from plants as well for animal and human life. In fact, the whole world becomes more lush, becomes greener, becomes healthier, and longer lived with more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere because more oxygen will attend that from the plants that consume the carbon dioxide. So the reality is, Carbon dioxide is not a pollutant, never was. It's a pollutant on Mars because there's no plant life there uh, per se. You know, there may be some algae growing. But on Earth, it's not a pollutant. It's very good for the environment, well, very good for I mean, life. One of the most fascinating things about Charles is uh, he's extremely close to both the hierarchy in Islam and in Judaism, isn't he? Can you just explain some of that? This is an aspect of his character. Very few people are aware that he's almost as close to uh, the Jews as he is to Muslims. Well, as a document in the Antichrist and Cup of Tea, he claims descent, as does the British monarchy historically from Jesus through the Merovingian lineage. That's an occult fraudulent lineage. It's one of the bases for... Uh, royalty in Europe claiming the right to rule, as it were, the divine right, so to speak. Secondly, and that's a, as a, a fraudulent claim from Jesus. Secondly, well, hang on, but yeah, because I mean, what they're saying is that Jesus had children. 
Yeah, he didn't. But that's a fraudulent teaching from the occult realm, and it was popularized in The Last Temptation of Christ and in Holy Blood, Holy Grail, and a variety of other works that have been put out there by non-Christians. But yeah, I want to answer so your not, question not also. A, yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah, but both Judaism, I mean, that's not an accepted uh, view in Christianity, is it, that Jesus had kids? But but what about the Jews no. and Muslims? So the next point is the British monarchy officially claims to sit upon David's throne, and Elizabeth was his Charles' mother was coronated Queen of Thy People Israel, quote unquote. And her official lineage chart published in London, which is offered with the Antichrist in a cup of tea by the publisher Prophecy House, shows those claims explicitly on it. And so Charles, when he's crowned here on May 6, three days from now, is going to be crowned King of Israel. And a lot of people don't realize that. He's not just being anointed with oil from Jerusalem, you know, from olives produced on the Mount of Olives, but he is being crowned king of Israel, not just England and so forth. So it's been taken seriously enough in Israel for since the 1970s, in fact, Tony, for decades, to have multiple announcements in Israel and discussion in the Israeli populace about Charles specifically, him personally, being a descendant of King David and what would happen one day when he's sitting on Britain's throne. So I suppose that is one reason to argue that maybe maybe it's important that he be on the throne, though I didn't think it was necessary. Well, I think Coming back, might well known, it might be known in Israel. It certainly isn't very well known in the UK. But what about Islam? So on Islam, Charles claims descent from Islam's prophet Muhammad. It's the Hashemite lineage. He's of the same lineage as Jordan's King Hussein, as Iraq's former Saddam Hussein. You know, et cetera. In other words, the same lineage that they would expect their Mahdi to come from, their successor prophet to Muhammad. Charles converted decades ago in the 1990s to Islam under one of the most prominent Sunni Muslims in the world, a guardian of Islam. And he also received an honorary doctorate in Islamic studies about, I don't know, several years later from the university there in Cairo, Egypt. He is viewed as a Muslim by the Muslims of the Middle East. And he is the most popular Westerner in the world, bar none, to the Muslims of the Middle East and the royals fam uh, royal families over there. So he has the ability to step in and say to the Islamic world, potentially, I'm your Mahdi, to Israel, I'm your Messiah, unbelieving Israel, to Christianity, whether Christianity, you know, mainline Christianity won't accept it, but a cult, you know, fake Christians might, you know, I'm a descendant of Jesus, I have the right to rule over you, that kind of thing. What about the history of this thing? Um, because I know that uh, there's been this kind of battle over the centuries between the occult uh, and, uh, uh, you know, over controlling the crowns. We've had an aristocracy in Europe, which has become very wealthy, very well or, well organized over the centuries, uh, even organizing this thing called the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, and those aristocrats, of course, uh, Charles is very much a part of that. He's not really, his name isn't really Charles Windsor. It's Charles Saxico. Gotha, uh, as the the British royal family is in fact German. Uh, so uh, if you, if we wind this back a little bit, uh, this aristocratic lineage, where does Charles fit into all of that? Well, so there are, there are multiple organs for how the New World Order slash now called Great Reset uh, has been orchestrated over literally centuries. Core to those are orders of knighthood. And the most prominent, and some of the most prominent orders of knighthood are actually in the UK. The, the most prominent one globally, and the oldest one globally, is known as the Order of the Garter. And by birth, the British monarch of the day and the Prince of Wales of the day, whomever they are, are the two highest ranking knights in that order. The other royal houses of Europe, uh, a number of them are knights in the Order of the Garter under the British monarchy. Japan's uh, king, emperor, I should say, is a knight in the Order of the Garter under the British monarchy. That's one example. And the Order of the Garter is a major, major player in this. So I go into extensive, you know, I extensively document it in the Antichrist Cup of Tea, but there's several others, uh, which you would know in the UK, like the Order of the Thistle, the Order of the Bath, uh, et cetera. So uh, that's one means. Other means are something that are more mundane. So the League of Nations gave rise to the United Nations the League of Nations itself came out of the Royal Institute of International Affairs, largely, or Chatham House, headed by Charles today, you know, and for decades now. The uh, World Economic Forum, Klaus Schwab, is a knight of Charles. Charles announced the Great Reset to the world. Klaus Schwab wrote a book with that title, but it didn't come out until months later. 
Charles is the first person to mention the Great Reset to the world. It's actually the actualization of the New World Order. That's under Charles. Klaus Schwab is one of Charles Knights. Bill Gates, who largely funds the World Health Organization, you know, Bill Gates of Microsoft fame, he is a Knight of Charles. The whole false Mideast peace process sits under Charles to this day, and it was initiated by Charles in 1987. And as I trace in the Antichrist and the Cup of Tea and another series of books coming, uh, that whole thing gave rise not just to the Oslo process, but to what we call the Quartet today and the Quartet's roadmap, which has been under a British subject of Charles. Uh, that's the whole world because the United Nations is the fourth member of the Quartet. That's under Charles. There are so many other things that I talk about in the Antichrist and Cup of Tea. Uh, all the major organs, all the major things that conspiracy theorists point to, to say they're central to uh, creation of the New World Order, like the modern Illuminati, uh, witchcraft, Satanism, Freemasonry, uh, the Trilateral Commission, the Councils on Foreign Relations in the United States, Israel, Canada, etc. Literally all of those things sit beneath Charles. And that's documented with hard evidence, traced, in fact, in the Antichrist and the Cup of Tea. Well, this is uh, another thing you talk about is the Order of the Garter being quite central to witchcraft. And uh, so what is the relationship between uh, the, say, the, this one order and other? Because obviously there are uh, witchcraft covens all over the place. How do they all fit together? And what's the relationship with Freemasonry? Because this seems to me to be uh, a kind of modern version, a much more acceptable version, uh, which was really founded in the late Middle Ages, around about the time of the English Civil War uh, as something which was much more palatable that, you know, anybody can join this. It's not really witchcraft at all. Well, Freemasonry and witchcraft are two different things. They have some things in common, but they're two different things. So the Order of the Garter, Order of the Garter was founded in 1348 by Edward the King and Edward the Black Prince, the Prince of Wales of the day. And it was founded by the Black Prince, the Prince of Wales, picking up a dropped garter of the Countess of Salisbury at a ball, which was a witch's garter, and so I'm going to come back to that. And instead of having her executed as a witch, he declared he'd make it uh, famous throughout the world, which he did. He founded the Order of the Garter, and that became the central symbol of the order. So the garter itself originally was a witch's garter, and in witchcraft, Wicca, uh, when there is a coven, that's a, a group of 13 witches, you know, so there's a priestess or a priest over that coven, the 13th witch, when you have a coven of covens, 13 times 13, then the witch, uh, whether male or female, who's over that is a witch king or a witch queen. When you multiply that by 13 again, they become a witch king of witch kings or a witch queen of witch queens. In the case of the Order of the Garter, the actual formal symbol that's used for the Order of the Garter today, the belt itself, the garter, is lined by two rows of 169 gold buckles each, which are horseshoe-shaped or small buckles. But each one of those buckles represents an individual coven uh, for a witch queen or, or, excuse me, for a queen, um, a priest or priestess, I'm trying to say, in, in uh, witchcraft. So it portrays the British monarch of the day and the Prince of Wales of the day as each being a witch king of witch kings or a witch queen of witch queens. So they're tied into Wicca in that way and in other ways that I document in the book, in both formal and informal. In terms of Freemasonry, uh, the blue degrees are in common between the York Rite and the Scottish Rite. Both rites have the, the, the uh, blue degrees in common. Those degrees originated in what was the Grand Lodge of England, became the United Grand Lodge of England. So whoever the Freemason is who is over that particular lodge, is viewed as the highest ranking Freemason in the world because of the fact that the blue degrees originated in that lodge. That Freemason uh, is actually a knight in the order of the garter under both the uh, king or queen and the prince of Wales of the day. So, so even without Charles being a Freemason himself, he's never admitted to being one, he is technically over Freemasonry globally by virtue of the order of the garter. Well, and also um, his, uh, well, I guess it's his great uncle, uh, Prince Michael of Kent, is the 
Grand Master of the United Grand Lodge uh, in London. Uh, but but let's just turn to sort of modern events, because I think we can kind of get to dwelling on the past and speculation. We quite clearly now know that there are increasing tensions in, in many parts of the world, uh, particularly on the axis between China and the United States, and also, of course, between Europe and US, uh, that is to say NATO, really, and Russia, as well as in the Middle East. We've got an extreme right wing government, the most right wing. I mean, they, they're actually openly fascist that now um, with the finance minister talking about, how, you know, actually he's, he's proud to be a fascist in Israel. Uh, and so that obviously is going to cause all sorts of problems um, with uh, with the Palestinians and possibly with other, you know, the wider Muslim world. So lots of tension there. Uh, and then, can we just start by looking at what's going on with the Russians? Uh, because uh, there is if you go right back to when you were talking about these orders of knighthood uh, the medieval teutonic knights fighting um the russians we had napoleon trying to uh, take over russia and failing we had exactly the same with with hitler we've now seemed to have an, another battle going on between nato and russia and and i've been looking i don't know what you make of this tim uh, at people who are pointing out that actually the real enemy here is the orthodox church you know we had the fourth crusade the pope launching an attack on the orthodox church and um so the catholics and the protestants uh, are not really necessarily being very good christians by uh, attacking this completely different form of ch- the early church which has a different version of easter uh, and many say is the actual original church so what do you make of these tensions initially there now uh, between Russia and NATO and their historical context. Okay, well, there, there's an awful lot in that to which I'd like to respond. I'll see how much we can get to uh, without going too long. So Russia, you know, has the Russian Orthodox Church, and their view is that the West is the devil. They're looking at what's happening in Anglican Protestantism and in some other denominations of, you know, ostensible Christianity such as the promotion of what I call sexual Satanism, you know, the LGBTQIA plus whatever movement, they see that being fomented in Ukraine, not just the neo-Nazi thing that concerns them and the fact that there are actual Nazis descended from the uh, Third Reich Nazis of World War II still in Ukraine to this day. So they're concerned about both of those things. They're concerned about Western culture, uh, you know, not just the military thing, but the Western culture encroaching on Russia through Ukraine, which is very much, you know, lined up with, for example, the United States with uh, elements, if you wanted to say in modern Israel, non-Christian modern Israel, the nation of Israel, which is non, you know, which has the same sexual Satanism going in it that the United States, the United Kingdom, et cetera, have. So Ukraine is lined up with all that. And to the Russian Orthodox Church, that's very bad. And you have a lot of Russians who are more conservative than that. And they're saying, this is just evil, and it's being promoted by the West. They not only want to bring the Nazis close to our borders or NATO close to our borders, they want to, you know, change Russia culturally to agree with all of these wicked things from the West. So they see it very much as a religious and a holy kind of a conflict, uh, as much as they do about one of, you know, an existential military threat if NATO continues to encircle Russia and encroach on its borders, you know, with with members of NATO, despite the fact that it's, you know, a defensive alliance. So I think that Putin was being truthful and honest when he said that his goal was to prevent NATO from taking over Ukraine and to prevent NATO from further encroaching on Russia's borders, and that that was his real justification for launching the attack, you know, the the so-called special military operation against Ukraine a bit over a year ago. So I think he was being truthful about that. And he tried multiple times, Russia did, to have talks, to bring the war to a halt, to get some agreement with Ukraine and particularly NATO to you know, step out of Ukraine, as it were, with no success. And in fact, the United Kingdom under Charles, particularly, but the United Kingdom under its military leaders under Charles, pushed back on that. They didn't want the peace talks. You know, there's this notion somehow in the West, this very corrupt Western world today, that Russia can be defeated. You know, if we just hang in there long enough, we can defeat Russia. The opposite is what's actually transpiring. We're depleting our munitions. We're depleting our ability to keep making war, even if we're using Ukraine as a proxy. 
Russia is not depleted. They've been ramping up their military production and they have China to help them, you know, on the side if they need it. Uh, North Korea has offered to provide munitions. Iran has provided drones. You can see the world polarizing into an alliance between, you know, roughly speaking, uh, Russia, North Korea, Iran, and of course, China. I mean, you're you're a former military man. You at least went to the academy, Tim. Uh, What do you make of this? Because it does seem as if this is a a completely unwinnable war. um, And yet the politicians, the pundits are talking it up all the time. And more and more Ukrainians are dying all the time. Well, I told you that Charles' agenda was not to save the world, right? That the ultimate agenda is really death. So if they insist on winning the war, in Ukraine, meaning the West does. And I'll tell you, Charles is at the top of that, along with England, the UK, and the United States. If they insist on winning the war against Russia, that leads to only one outcome, and that's World War III, where Russia goes beyond Ukraine's borders from necessity, you know, as we continue to push against Russia through Ukraine, goes beyond Ukraine's borders and attacks NATO countries, and then enters Europe and so forth, and pretty quickly, we're on World War III. Now, I wrote about this in my book, North Korea, Iran, and the Coming World War, Behold a Red Horse, published in 2018. And you and I did some past interviews on that. But I'm anticipating that that stuff will trigger not with Russia, but with North Korea and Iran, meaning that uh, we'll see war break out with North Korea and Iran simultaneously. And when that happens, Russia and China will take advantage, further advantage of the situation. China will most likely go after Taiwan at that point. You know, while North Korea is going after South Korea and we're occupied in both arenas, Russia and China will be able to do other things. And it's going to be incredibly hard for the West to deal with it because we're already stretched too thin. We're already not, uh, we already are outmissiled, if you will, by Russia currently, you know, with hypersonic missiles, with modern nuclear weapons, which Russia has, we do not. You know, the West has gotten lazy. And, um, so my view is we're heading for World War III, and if NATO doesn't you know, step down pretty quickly here and say, you know what, we really need to negotiate a, a peace arrangement with Russia or at least an armistice and, uh, and agree to not bring NATO into Ukraine, et cetera, and let Russia keep some of that territory. You know, well, I don't know if that. you're familiar with uh, Albert Pike. Uh, he was the Grand Master of... Uh, the um, Scottish Rite Freemasons, and he he apparently came up with a plan. And there is some dispute over this supposed letter which disappeared from the British Museum. Uh, But the centrepiece of his World War Three was planned to be uh, a battle between the Zionists and the Nihilists. Um, the, what he said, oh, and, and the Muslims, and actually the idea being to discredit all faiths, uh, and so to bring in a kind of pantheistic religion on the back of that war, which would be blamed on God. Basically, the idea is that uh, you know all these different faiths they're fighting each other. Uh, so, what do you make of uh, of that? I don't know how familiar you are with it, and 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 how that might transpire. Yeah, I'm very familiar with it, including Albert Pike's letter and his prediction of three world wars. But uh, I I would say that uh, what's happening is fairly close to, and that was their plan. It wasn't just a prediction from Pike. You know, this was their intention for, from a long time back. It's People have a hard time believing that this stuff has been orchestrated over such a long period, but in reality it has. Speaking of Israel, you know, you talked about the Muslims being concerned about what the Israeli government is doing. That's not the real concern that they have, Tony, the real concern they have is the possibility of an Israeli government deciding to rebuild the temple on the Temple Mount to re-implement the sacrifices to annex, you know, the West Bank, the territory that's part of Judea and Samaria historically, you know, part of historical Israel deeded to Israel by God. That's what they fear. And anything that allows Israel to move in that direction, whether it be through the government through judicial reform. The reason they want judicial reform in Israel is because there have been times when the Israeli government would have moved to do things like annex the land and so forth, and they were making baby steps toward that, and the Israeli Supreme Court stepped in and overturned what the Israeli government was wanting to do. So they want to take some of that power away from the Israeli Supreme Court. Yeah, and then they've got the red heifers the in the land head, Tim, we've recently had the former head of the Shin Bet saying that Israel is in danger of becoming a dictatorship. 
yeah, that's nonsense. This is the same. You know, we see all the uh, coup stuff happening in the United States, and the Biden regime is, in fact, a coup regime. Trump won in reality. The election was stolen from him. The same people who are behind that, the globalists who are behind that, they're not all in the United States. The very same people who are behind that, who are under Charles, are also behind the fomenting of the unrest in modern Israel and these claims of a totalitarian government and, the, and those sorts of things against Netanyahu and his relatively right coalition. So, so it's not true, but this is what's being put out through the fake news media. What do you think Charles's role might be? Uh, war. I mean, because I mean, I think many people do understand. Crikey, are they planning a war? They certainly seem to be. We've had a massive increase in military spending, and one of the major indicators of a war, Tim, is economic crisis. So, with all these sanctions being imposed here, there, and everywhere, it's almost as if uh, the West is is actually you know trying to precipitate an economic crisis almost uh, you know making sure that world trade grinds to a halt slowly uh, and of course once uh, you can't trade anymore people start to pick up the gun to go and get what they want so the collapse is intentional and they've begun the process we see some major banks failing here in the united states now it's just the beginning their intention is to roll it all up into the larger banks like chase and a few others a handful of banks And once they're there, and those banks, by the way, are already under the control of the globalists under Charles, the big ones. Once they're rolled up, then they'll finish the collapse and they'll bring in CBDCs in addition to a global digital ID. That's their goal. That's their plan. That's what they're working toward. They want to be able to implement that in the 2025, 2026 timeframe. They'd like to actually have it enacted at that point. So who knows, you know, if it'll happen that fast. But uh, their desire is to collapse the global economic system, not just in the United States or the UK, but globally, to be able to force that and to force it on the world. And that's part of the purpose of the WHO pandemic treaty, the so-called pandemic treaty, which, you know, again, Bill Gates largely funds the WHO along with the United States and the United Nations. Uh, Bill Gates being a knight of Charles. Biden, for example, is trying to force the United States into that by not, you know, they're calling it an agreement instead of a treaty so it can bypass our constitutional laws here in the United States. Biden is, he wants to do that in May, this month, right after Charles' coronation. And if he signs on to that, then literally it will give the World Health Organization the ability to override, ignore, and change the laws of the United States. And the WHO wants, you know, 197 nations, I think it is, to sign on to that treaty, something like that. When they get enough sign on, their intention then is to basically force a digital ID on the world and they'll do it under the color of a so-called pandemic. In other words, they'll be able to declare any kind of pandemic, whether it's climate based, you know, a pandemic of the earth, like a climate pandemic, whether it's biologically based against humans, they'll make it up as they go and they'll be able to force lockdowns, change national laws, do all kinds of wicked stuff. But at the top center of that, is the implementation of a global digital ID, taking that idea of a vaccine passport to a whole new level. And so when you combine that with central bank digital currencies, you effectively get all the plumbing for the mark of the beast under Charles as the Antichrist. Going back to... um uh, the Albert Pike letter, for example, I don't know if you think it's genuine. It certainly, it certainly so far seems to be. I mean, for example, this is written in the uh, uh, 1870s, uh, 1871, to Giuseppe Mazzini, who was one of the founders of the Mafia. Uh, and it talks about the First World War being about overthrowing the Tsars and Im- implementing the uh, atheistic uh, communist state there. Uh, also talks about getting rid of the, uh, or it implies anyway, getting rid of the uh, old Ottoman Empire and the British taking over in uh, the uh, Middle East in the uh, Holy Land. And then it talks about the Second World War uh, being um, between communism and fascism, but also making sure that the state of Israel is created. Uh, And a Third World War, yes, it says uh, it takes... Uh, political Zionists and the leaders of the Islamic world put, gets them to be fighting each other and they 
what he what he says is they mutually destroy each other, which is what, what may well happen uh, if there is a war in the Middle East between Israel and Iran, is that both countries might end up with, you know, very, very little left, particularly in the nuclear age. Uh, and then he says something very interesting. He says, meanwhile, the other nations, once more divided on this issue, will be constrained to fight to the point of complete physical, moral, spiritual and economic exhaustion. Then he says, this is where the nihilists come in. We shall unleash the nihilists and the atheists. We shall provoke a formidable social cataclysm, which in all its horror will show clearly to the nations the effect of absolute atheism, the origin of savagery and the most bloody turmoil. Then everywhere, he says, the citizens obliged to defend themselves against the world minority of revolutionaries will exterminate those destroyers of civilization and the multitude disillusioned with Christianity uh, whose deistic spirits will from that moment be without compass or direction, anxious for an ideal, but without knowing where to render its adoration, will receive the true light through the universal manifestation of the pure doctrine of Lucifer, brought finally out into the public view. Uh, so he then says, well, what he's doing, he says, finally, in the final paragraph, uh, it will be about the destruction of Christianity and atheism, both conquered and exterminated at the same time. Now, I mean, this is uh, it, yeah, it, this is an interesting uh, potential scenario. And if you look at what's been going on, particularly with uh, the use of atheistic communism uh, in China now, which is what I'm coming around to talking about, uh, actually setting up the United States and China as the two main opposing factions in the Third World War. Um, well, that's... Largely accurate, Albert Pike missed a lot. So I'll say this. There's seven seals summarizing the book of Revelation, the apocalypse. Yeah, it's okay, roughly so a it's seal probably prior. fair to say, sorry, Tim, it's probably fair to say that that is, uh, it seems to be sort of laying it out as a plan. This is what we intend to do. Uh, and some have actually said that the book of Revelation is written by the same people that wrote that. Uh, you know, so the idea is that this is a, a satanic plan is, is actually written in Revelation. So how can you, can you compare the two, the, the letter and the book book for us? Well, the book of Revelation goes back to the first century AD. There's a, an enormous amount of hard evidence for that. So it couldn't have been written by the same folks. Secondly, uh, it's roughly a seal per year starting in Revelation chapter 6 in the New Testament, which summarizes the final seven years preceding Armageddon. When you get to the second seal, which is that fiery red horse, the one that I address in my book, North Korea ran in the coming world war, Peace gets taken from the earth by the rider of that fiery red horse. Now, I've identified that horse as the uh, national symbol of North Korea. It's their national symbol. It overlooks downtown Pyongyang. They have it on their currency. They name their armaments after it, et cetera. It also happens to be associated with Exxon Mobil, uh, of Mobil Oil Corporation in the United States. So we have an association with it here as well. And then to this rider is given a sword to take peace from the earth. In other words... World War III commences under the rider of that second seal in the second year of the Tribulation Week. That's before we get to the Great Tribulation where Israel is attacked and half of Jerusalem taken captive in war. Those latter events take place in the fourth year of the Tribulation Week. So we're going to see uh, some version of a global war that involves North Korea and the sword, say the sword of Islam or even the sword of Russia, both really. Now, you got the Mother Russia statue with that huge sword in its hand. And then the sword, of course, is associated with Islam as the religion of the sword. You've got North Korea allied behind the scenes with Russia and even before that, Iran, uh, in ballistic missiles and nuclear technology. And then you have uh, the United States allied with Saudi Arabia and some other nations besides Israel in the Middle East. And then you got South Korea, you know, kind of caught in the middle and Taiwan and Japan and so forth besides the rest of NATO. So the point is, we can see World War III happen really, really fast. I mean, very fast, once things break loose with North Korea and Iran. And of course, when they break through with Iran, that also means war in the Middle East because the, uh, they'll break out with Israel too at that point. But that is still before we get to the Great Tribulation. And at the start of the Great Tribulation, which is the point at which Charles will be possessed by the devil, by the way, and become the, the, the person over a new global government, OK, but at the point of the start of the Great Tribulation, Jerusalem will be encircled successfully by Israel's adversaries and only half the city will be taken by force in war from Israel 
We see that in Zechariah chapters 12 to 14 in the Old Testament, also somewhat in Revelation chapter 11 in the New Testament. But the point is, uh, there are things that happen uh, basically with World War III before we get to the stuff that happens really in the Middle East that's really, really bad with regard to Israel and the start of the Great Tribulation. Okay, so look, what the one thing which is most useful for people to hear, Tim, is what should we look out for? So, uh, I mean, there's a, a wonderful section in Revelation, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Now, this is quite clearly written in there uh, so that when these events transpire, people will all recognise it. It may be that uh, it's very difficult to predict exactly what they mean beforehand. But once they've happened, it's very clear. Uh, I mean, for example, uh, the white horse may be someone appearing as a saviour. The second, the red horse, may be some kind of war. The black horse certainly looks like a, a an economic disaster, collapse of, uh, uh, you know, massive increase in food prices. The pale horse, it may be disease and famine. But anyway, the idea, I think you understand, is that the, the, the Bible is there to, when these things do transpire, to warn us. So what have you got to say about the way that this... Uh, um, calamity may tr uh, transpire and may unfold uh, that will help us indicate well hang on this is where we are in this i mean many of us may not even survive and see it uh, but what do you think are the key moments uh, in what unfolds so we'll see some sort of imposition of an agreement or a treaty based on daniel 9 uh, 27 chapter 9 verse 27 that's imposed under charles as the antichrist that's probably still coming. Uh, I could have argued for the Great Reset, but I'm not sure that we're in the Tribulation Week yet. The Great Reset being under him, which you know all the world practically is signed on to at this point. Could have argued for that as the Treaty of Daniel 9.27. I don't think that that's it right now. So we're probably still looking for that, and that coincides with the start of the ride of that white horse. But on my YouTube channel, people can go to the playlist for the Antichrist, and they can thumb down through that and see the one thumbnail that shows that blue horse from Denver International Airport on the thumbnail. Watch that. In that video, they'll see the identities of the white horse and that. The Antichrist role is to do with um, war and peace. And can, so can you say exactly what you think may transpire there? Uh, because obviously, if someone comes along and manages to stop a third world war, they will be greeted as a superhero. First of all, Charles is already running the world behind the scenes. Even before we have a global government, he's been running it since 1969, and that's documented in the Antichrist and Cup of Tea. He's the one in control already. Secondly, uh, the fiery red horse when that World War III breaks out involving North Korea and Iran and you know all these other nations afterwards very quickly, that will indicate we're in the second year of the Tribulation Week when that comes. We're not there yet when it happens. We're already in the second year of the last seven. In the fourth year, we have multiple things that happen. One is Charles will receive a mortal wound as the Antichrist and recover from it and be possessed by the devil. And the global government will be constituted at the same time. And half of Jerusalem will be taken captive in war by force from Israel. And the idol to Charles, that winged statue that portrays him as a winged god, given to him in the 1990s, or excuse me, early 2000s, I mean to say, that the BBC photograph, the full-size version of that, I expect to see that placed on the Temple Mount in a newly constructed holy place at that time. So even before that, we'll see a move in Israel to begin to reconstruct a temple. And this is where it gets very significant, Tony, with regard to what happens May 6th in three days. In three days, when Charles is crowned, not just king of the UK, but king of Israel and anointed with oil from Jerusalem, there will be people right after that in Israel who'll be looking to Charles as possibly the Messiah, non-believers in Israel, non-Christians. And then they'll be looking at the red heifers very soon. There are five in Israel. They'll be inspecting each one in order as they reach two years in a day and age each to see if they're actually still red when they each reach that age. And if any one of them is, that combination of things, having a male monarch who claims to sit upon David's throne, who's already been suggested in Israel as possibly a descendant of King David, and then having the, uh, a red heifer turned to ashes in Israel, that combination will cause a huge push in Israel to reconstruct the temple, to restart the sacrifice and offering, to do the very things that so terrify the Muslim world. 
watch out when that happens. Okay. Uh, also, I mean, you know, it does seem like this is almost like a kind of religion uh, of people who are on an ego trip. Um, you know, the idea really being that they think they're gods, Tim. Who are we talking about? The people in well, charge? I'm talking, about, I'm talking about those who associate with uh, this Antichrist figure, whoever it turns out to be. I mean, they they obviously think that they are born to rule. Uh, it's almost, I think, a bit like heroin, you know, kind of pa- power can be like that. It, it, it is whatever power you've got, it's never enough. Well, look at what Klaus Schwab said. You'll own nothing and be happy. If, if, if nothing says power trip like that, <laughs> I mean, what does? I mean, that guy let it go to his head, and he was serious. They have a plan to do this. He Charles. certainly seems to be. Anyway, look, uh, the 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 uh, it's easy to kind of get uh, drawn into all this uh, bad stuff, particularly a third world war. Obviously, that's not going to be fun. Uh, but at the, actually, at the end of it all, uh, there's going to be this battle called Armageddon, isn't there? Yes. Yeah, so at the end of the seven years, we'll see the nations gather for war against Christ and His angels. And I presume, I think, based on a whole lot of study and knowledge, um, that the world will view Christ's return with his angels as an alien invasion and go to war on that basis, most likely. That's how they'll be animated under the devil and Charles as the Antichrist and the false prophet to stir them up to gather to that battle, presuming that they're fighting off either an alien invasion or that if they don't beat Christ, he's going to kill them. Because they've been serving uh, well, the I mean, devil surely, and the Antichrist. Will, I mean, surely there will be, um, you know, sort of human participants and some nations even may be, uh, you know, uh, under siege. And then this heavenly army comes to their rescue. Is that not what will happen? Do you think it's just going to be uh, everybody on Earth is going to be fighting uh, against this heavenly host? Well, all the nations will participate under Charles as the Antichrist. You know, under the Antichrist. And I'm not saying, you know, if he's the Antichrist at this point, there's no question publicly that he's the Antichrist. Anybody can see that by looking at the evidence even that I share on my YouTube channel, which is just author Tim Cohen. But that being said, uh, we will get to a point where the nations having served the devil and the Antichrist, you know, for for the predominance of the Great Tribulation, that three and a half years preceding Christ's return, return in Armageddon. We'll see, you know, Christ return to Israel. This is before Armageddon. He'll return to Israel, the survivors of Israel, which would be about a third of the nation, two thirds will die who are in Judea, which is where most of modern Israel's population center is. And I'm speaking of Israelite population, not the so-called Palestinians. I mean, literally since the beginning of 2023, we've seen mass demonstrations by Israeli citizens, many of whom uh, are, you know, even even if it's reform um, Judaism, uh, they certainly identify as Jewish and identify with the Old Testament. They've been out on the streets protesting against their government. Well, I mean, I neglected to mention this, but uh, it is in my books, including my coming Messiah history in the tribulation period series. And I've talked about it for years, including in presentations. But biblically, there will be a civil war in Israel preceding the start of the great tribulation. So in the fourth year uh, of the tribulation week before the great tribulation starts, so before half of Jerusalem is taken captive in war, that will be preceded by a civil war in Israel, much as there was a civil war that created this schism between Judea and Israel, or, you know, two, uh, two plus tribes and ten plus tribes in the fourth millennium, the fourth day of the week of history from Adam and Eve, in the fourth year of the tribulation week, or the, in that year that the great tribulation starts, there'll be a civil war. So what we're seeing happening in Israel, and by the way, Tony, there's a huge amount of talk, and there has been for several months now, but it's accelerating in the Israeli press about a coming civil war in Israel. People are really fearful of that in Israel today because of the very things that that you and the Western press are noticing. But like I said, that's being stirred up under Charles, uh, the same people who have stolen the election in the US who want to prevent the Israeli government from doing certain things. The people who are fomenting that civil war are largely outside of Israel. But ignorant Israelis are going along with it, liberals, non-Christians, you know, people who are part of the sexual satanic movement in Israel, in other words, homosexuals and so forth in Israel, they're fomenting a civil war, and that's the direction it's going in Israel right now. 
So uh, I think it's a little bit confusing for some, even for me. Can you just explain this whole idea of the weeks of the tribulation? Because I'd actually much rather hear about the number of years it's going to take. So if we imagine it um, kicking off uh, with an enormous war uh, at the beginning, is that how it starts or is that halfway through? As I understand it, it starts with a war, then there's three and a half years, and then some kind of peace treaty, which then breaks down after another three and a half years. Can you just spell it out for us? Yeah, I'd be happy to. A lot of people think what you just said, uh, that the seven years begin with a war. That's not correct. In fact, uh, it's not till you get to the second year under that second seal that peace is taken from the earth, that there's actual global warfare developing, if you will, and happening. So in the first year of the tribulation week, there's not global war. People look at what's happening with Ukraine and Russia when right now. The, okay, so when you say the tribulation week, that's seven years, is it? Yes, let me clarify. Okay. Um, yeah, a lot of people, the technical, correct biblical description is it's the 70th period of seven years from Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. That's a lot of wordiness. And to me, I just summarize it by saying, okay, it's the tribulation week, a week of years. It's also called the tribulation period. Those are non-biblical terms, but they're summarizing phrases, if you will, for that period of seven years. So you're saying, the war chapter nine, verse 27. you're saying the war you think will break out in the second year, according to the Bible? Yes, that's correct. And uh, there'll be a progression of things that happen. So initially, not global war. Then in the second year, you have global war developing or happening. Then in the third year, you have all kinds of things that happen. But among those things are global famine, basically where it becomes very expensive to purchase the grain for the equivalent of a loaf of bread. You know, a day's wage to buy the equivalent of uh, of a loaf of bread's grain. So uh, famine far beyond what the world has seen in modern history, developing in that third year, along with lawfare, all kinds of things described in my books. Too much to go into in this conversation, but that's the third seal. When you get to the fourth seal, the fourth year of the tribulation week, in that year, uh, if you could take the fourth day of the week of history, which is a thousand years long, you know, after Adam and Eve, and condense it into a single year, you get a pretty good picture of what happens in the fourth year of the tribulation week. But in that year, I expect to see civil war in Israel. I expect to see Israel successfully attacked and half of Jerusalem taken by force after that, after the city's encircled by the nations of the world, the whole world taking it by force from Israel. So we're talking about East Jerusalem where the Temple Mount area sits. And of course, before that, they'll have restarted the sacrifice and offering uh, they'll have rebuilt a holy place before that uh, on the Temple Mount. And I expect to see Charles mortally wounded, the formation of that global government, Charles to recover, he'll be possessed by the devil and his personality will change with that. And then that idol to Charles placed in, a, in the newly constructed holy place atop the Temple Mount so that that abomination of desolation described in the Olivet Discourses by Christ in the New Testament, that's what that will be. And then for the next three and a half years, we have the Great Tribulation where it's hell on earth, basically. Hell is following behind everything at that point that Charles as the Antichrist being possessed by the devil is doing for the following three and a half years, <clears throat> leading to Armageddon. Right, so, uh, I mean, it does sound like he's not gonna be able to uh, actually, oops, yeah, he's. So it does sound as if he's going to have a job, Tim, in uh, actually convincing people. I mean, if it's if it's going to be so awful, how is he going to convince anyone to follow him? I don't think he needs to. I think everyone already is, and they don't know it. You know, you can look at what the globalists are doing. They're doing it without people's permission, and they're doing it anyway, and they're getting away with it. We live in a world that's becoming more and more lawless, where the people yeah. who are supposed to be what's that yeah I, I, yeah I agree with you i, I mean i think uh, when it comes to the end of this period there is certainly going to be conflict still going on on earth uh between you know the the the, the forces of light and the forces of darkness is or, you know probably a simple way to put it uh, uh anyway we just just uh, can you just round up by um giving us an idea of uh, of the positive ending to it all because obviously at the end of the day through all this difficulty uh right wins out the good triumph 
Yes, the positive end is that despite all the bad things the world and Christians are going to go through, when Christ returns with his angels, the effort that Satan and the fallen angels and the demons under them and then the humans who are following them make to defeat Christ and his angels will fail. In fact, it'll be no contest. You know, the devil is insane and his minions following him are insane and they'll get to be more and more insane. We see insanity on the rise literally by the day in the world currently. It, you know, 20 years ago, your job, your job would have dropped. Mine would have dropped at looking at the things that people are embracing right now as we're talking. So it's going to accelerate and continue to get worse and worse. And part of that is the world being so insane that it somehow thinks that it can defeat Christ and his angels when he comes from heaven, exactly as written in Scripture. And what will happen is the Lord will speak the word and he'll mow them down with that word, that sword that proceeds from his mouth in a day. Slaughter hundreds of millions of people, literally, and end mankind's, unbelieving mankind's militaries in a day. And with that, he will then, uh, of course, have the church with him, will be resurrected or translated in our new bodies at that point. Scripture tells us, Tony, that the earth, the planet, will be so damaged at that point that if the Lord didn't return when he comes back, no flesh would survive, meaning nothing on the planet would survive. It would become deader, as I say, than Mars today, but completely dead. Bacteria wouldn't survive in Earth's ocean for very long. Everything would die. That's how damaged Earth will be by the time Armageddon happens and then when it's over. So right after Armageddon, with the church being with the Lord, the Lord will send the survivors. He'll allow a few to survive. He won't kill everybody. He'll send the survivors to gather the survivors of the nations before him for some additional judgments. This is the, at the start of his thousand year reign. Those judgments will conclude roughly 75 days after his return, roughly. And following that, he will supernaturally heal the world, meaning, meaning after that, the world will be healed by him to become like the Garden of Eden. So it will go almost overnight from being incapable of continuing to sustain any life to being like the Garden of Eden. And at the same time, when that happens, only Christians will be alive on the planet anywhere. There'll be no non-Christians anywhere on planet Earth alive, period. And so a new church will form, a mortal one, you know, of the newly born again believers of surviving mankind. And then in addition to that, we who are Christians now will be with the Lord in our new eternal bodies and he will begin his thousand year reign. It will become heaven on Earth from what had been hell on Earth in a very short period. Well, um, let's hope so. Uh, look, one of the uh, one of the um, uh, basic things that um, people need to understand is this thing called the sinner's prayer, which is quite important. I mean, I don't actually see it copied and sort of little prayer cards put much around these days. Uh, it's um, it starts like this. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and to eat with him and he with me. That's from Revelation 3.20. The prayer is, Lord Jesus Christ, I come to you today or tonight because I'm a sinner. Right now, Lord Jesus, I repent of my sin. I turn away from my sin and I turn to you, Jesus. I believe, dear Lord, you died for me. Your blood covers my sin and washes away my sin. I thank you, dear Lord. I open the door to my heart. Come in, Lord Jesus. Wash me and cleanse me. Make me your child as I receive you now by faith. I close the door now with you inside, Lord Jesus. Help me to live for you every day until you come again. I thank you, Lord Jesus. Today or tonight, I've received you in the presence of these witnesses and you have received me. I love you and praise you for saving me. Dear Father Yahweh, in Jesus' name, amen. Mm, amen. Thank you for that, Tony. That's but, awesome. as, but as many as received Jesus to them, he gave power to become the children of God. That's from John 1, 12. So that's one thing you can do. Uh, but what, what else can we do, do you think, to prepare for all this, Tim? Well, we have an economic system, Tony, coming that's going to be a complete lockdown of humanity. Basically, that's their goal. They won't completely succeed with it. There'll be people, Christians, who do not take the mark. There'll be many who are martyred or who die from deprivation for not taking the mark, you know, which will be required to buy or sell per scripture. And by the way, I have another book coming on the mark of the beast that goes into a lot of things most Christians who deal with that topic don't know. 
But that being said, uh, it's imperative upon Christians right now, because all these things are about to happen right now to begin preparing to live outside of the economic system. That means storing food in advance, storing water in advance, having a place to go, having land. Not everybody can do that. Most people can't do most of those things. But if each of us does what God shows us to do as a Christian, you know, seek God, ask him to show you what you can do, what he'd have you do, then together we can prepare for ourselves, for our families, for our neighborhoods, for our churches, so that there can be a remnant of Christians surviving through all of this and witnessing to and winning, you know, non-Christians all around us as these things are happening. And the church is going to go through all of this, Tony. There's not going to be a pre- or mid-tribulational rapture like a lot of Christians claim. Those are lies from the enemy meant to catch the church off guard. And unfortunately, a lot of Christians have been suckered by that still. Yeah, but kind of, I am well, sitting here false, saying no, we're going through it. it. It's a false hope, isn't it, that's been, uh, you know, from the enemy, essentially. Uh, okay, yes, so um, what about uh, if you could just... Um, uh, give us, you, you know, explain whereabouts to get your your book on North Korea and obviously this Antichrist in a Cup of Tea book. If people want to check up what you've got to say there. Yes, those books and about 38 others that I'll have coming in the next two to three years. But those books they can get now. They can get at prophecyhouse.com on the Internet. P-R-O-P-H-E-C-Y-H-O-U-S-E.com. And Prophecy House is my publisher. And now, Tim, I have to press you on this because the Antichrist in a Cup of Tea, the latest edition, I mean, I've been talking to you on and off for two or three years now. You keep saying it's about to be published. It's about to be published. When is it really going to be published? Uh, right now. So it should be shipping between the end of this month and sometime next month. And so, yeah, so that's May, right now. May, June, May, June 2023. Yep. Okay, Tim Cohen, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you, Tony.